Okay, this is E2900, week 4, lecture 2. And in this lecture, we're going to basically get into Boolean algebra, uh, get into Boolean algebra. So, but first, let's recall, oops, so recall uh, some ideas behind Boolean algebra that we discussed a couple of weeks back. This was before Christmas break, so this will be a good review. So, logic functions are functions of zeros and ones and basically zero could be defined as uh, false and one as true and remember George Boole was a logician but uh, basically this is Boole but we're not going to use this false and true in the sense it's just zeros and ones digital logic okay so which implies Boolean algebra is the mathematics behind digital logic and that's why we need to know this okay in a simple sense is you know if you want a simple justification so also recall this is number one number two you can have a logic function of n variables that is x0 is the input let's say through xn then you have let's say one output y okay Let's see an example where we can have multiple output logic functions, but basically the number of logic functions of an input is you have 2 to the 2 to the n because you have, let's say you have a 2 input x0, x1, then you have 4 possibilities of inputs, but you can have 2 possibilities for each possibility of input, so you have 2 to the 16th number of uh, logic functions uh, for two uh, logic functions of two inputs so this expression makes sense you can easily prove it let's say using mathematical induction etc and a uh, side note again which i mentioned a few weeks back is your book starts from x1 and goes to starts at x1 but i'm going to start the least significant digit at x0 okay but let's look at some examples so here is a logic function of one variable so x0, y, 0, 1, 1, 0. The one which we most commonly use is the not x0, it's y. And also recall that I can have a multiple input not gate. Basically, it's a bus. Okay, so this is the designation for a bus. So let's say I can have like an 8 input or a byte not gate. And in lab, if you recall, we used a hex inverter. That is, it had, that is in lab zero, it had six NOT gates in one chip. But there it is, okay? So in other words, if you want a X7 through X0, so you have Y7 through Y0. So if this is all zeros, for example, this is all whoops, this is all ones, okay? But you can have something, let's say, 0, 0, 0, I don't know, 1, 0, then the output will be 1, dot, dot, dot. Where do I have an extra dot here? I have no idea. Mathematically, there should be three dots. So, and a 0 and a 1. So, a, so this is at uh, x1, per se. But it's all very trivial, these ideas. And we also talked about logic functions of two variables. So let's look at that. x1, x0. Uh, let's call this y1. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is 0, 0, 0, 1. This is called the logical AND. Okay. So right there, that's the, whoops, that's the mathematical symbol is the dot. It looks like multiplication, but it's not. Here is the schematic symbol. And we talked about OR, we talked about exclusive OR, and we also talked about what is called associativity that is x2 and x1 and x0 doesn't matter what order we do this in x2 x1 x0 so physically speaking 
if I x1 and x0 first and then I and it with x2 that is the same as let's say taking um, x0 and then anding it with x2 x1 if you want a physical circuit schematic there is but basically this associativity is a law of boolean algebra before we get into the laws of boolean algebra let's these are all review let's look at timing diagrams okay and this is let's see what section in the book this is Huh. It's not here, but anyway. Timing diagrams. You can read up in the appropriate section of the book. It is basically another uh, way to represent logic functions. Uh, it's a plot of logic values versus time there are other methods to represent logic functions let's say Venn diagrams we're not going to cover that in this book ah, sorry I just sipped a cup of coffee anyway uh, the timing diagrams are useful or important because uh, used to and they're used everywhere in data sheets etc used to indicate propagation delay All right that's the primary reason why we need to know this idea of timing diagram and it's not really difficult uh, for example let's take this logic function right so let's say we and to make it interesting let's and two signals okay let's say there is and we looked at propagation delay again uh, recall actually lab zero so going back, let's make a knot. So maybe let's make a NAND gate, but then let's separate out. Let's call this delta tau. So I don't know, let's call this F, just F, all right? So what we can do is we can basically plot the logic value. So let's say we have x1, x0. So x1 is initially 0, and then it goes to a 1, okay? Right there, this is at some time. Uh, let's see, x1, and then let's do something for correspondingly for x0 so this is logic 1 okay and x0 is 0 for quite some time right and at some other time value it goes to a 1 and then let's just leave it at this now let's say the ultimate goal would be to look, plot the timing diagram for F, but as a good rule of thumb, and I'll put this in red, you should always plot the intermediate signals. Because as you will see when you, again, recall from last lecture that I recommended you start practicing the suggested problems. As you practice problems, you will see that, especially when the timing diagrams incorporate non-zero propagation delays, it becomes pretty difficult to draw the final timing diagram for the output without looking at the intermediate signals, okay? So, uh, x1 and x0, let's look at the timing diagram for this. So, when, you, when x1 goes to a 1, 1 and 0 is still 0, so this remains at 0. But basically, when x0 also goes to a 1, the output is a 1, but it takes place delta t later. So, on timing diagrams, this is usually indicated like this right there is there's a delay of delta t propagation delay before it goes to a one and this in turn gets delayed by this little delta tau right so this transition here doesn't take place till here so in other words it's switching back actually let me do it this way i don't want to use red for these two you want to use a different color you don't have to use a different color but basically this transition transition gets uh, propagated to the output only there this transition gets propagated to the output only there 
So in other words, your F was initially a 1 till there, and let's call this T1 and let's call this T2. So here's the time axis, if you will. And people usually don't draw this time axis because it's pretty messy. Uh, so, I mean, the function of time is implied, so I'm just going to erase it. Whoops, I'm still in erase mode. So it's right there. expand upon this, in the sense right there, I'm going to make the line longer. But anyway, the basic idea is that propagation delay from the input to the output here is delta t plus delta tau. Okay. So, oops. I wish there were an easier way to, I mean a quicker way to switch colors, but there it is, okay. So in, and delta, so let's see, this is basically here, delta tau, and delta t and delta tau need not be equal to each other, but the worst case propagation delay tp is delta t plus delta tau. So again, I, like I guess recommend it, it's useful if you, I mean, it's instructive for you to draw all the intermediate signals, and there are a lot of practice problems from your book, and you should practice this, okay, it seems very trivial, but it can get pretty hairy when you have like a lot of uh, logic gates. Okay. So now, having talked about timing diagrams, let's get into the crux of the of 2900, which is Boolean algebra. And this is section 2.5 in your book. Okay. So the interesting thing uh, about any mathematical system is that there are some you could say God-given truths, which are called axioms. Okay. So these axioms are statements that we take without any proof. Right. So the axioms of Boolean algebra are not that many. But this whole ask axioms things is pretty interesting, in the sense there's a logician, or there was a logician named Kurt Gödel. There's a very good book called uh, Gödel, Escher, and Bach which if you haven't heard of or if you haven't read, you should read. But anyway, this guy came up with something called as the incompleteness theorem, where he basically said, or sorry, he proved that if you take any mathematical, uh, I, I can only, I, I believe I only understand a summary, high level summary of what he did. His work is so beautiful that when he used to, he used to work at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and he was there at the same time Einstein was there, and Einstein was supposed to have remarked that it was an honor for him to walk home every day with Kurt Goodell. But Goodell basically proved that if you take any mathematical system, you need to have axioms. And let's say you come up with a system where the axioms become theorems, you have to introduce axioms to do that. So any mathematical system is incomplete in the sense that there has to be axioms for it to work, and he proved this. But anyway, it's fascinating. Um, that's why I mentioned this aside. But the axioms of Boolean algebra are, I'll, okay, when I go through section 2.5, as you will notice if you, and you should have read the book, there are a lot of acts, there are theorems, there are, there's a lot of writing, right? I'm not going to write all the axioms, all the theorems. I'm just going to do particular examples. And again, you should practice a lot so you understand these ideas okay, down cold. So zero and zero is zero, okay? Recall that the, this is the or sign, one or one is one. And there's a whole bunch of these axioms. So dot dot dot. So for A, for B, for example, if X is zero, then so X naught is one. If X is one, then X naught is zero. And this is the not function. Again, if you think about it, in the case of, in this case, it makes intuitively to call this the not. You can call this anything else, but it, it makes sense to call it the not, right? Now, let's look at some single variable theorems, right? 
some of these are should be obvious some of these may not be maybe all of them are obvious but uh, you should these are not axioms these can be proved using obviously a truth table but I don't recommend this or axioms okay, and it's recommended you use axioms Because it's more elegant to use an axiom. So an example of a single variable theorem is x and 0 equals 0. And it's kind of obvious how to prove this using axioms in the sense you can simply use this axiom starting out. With, so because x is a Boolean variable, x is 0 or 1, so 0 and 0 by axiom 1a is true okay this is very trivial at least this single variable theorem so let's look at something more exciting and prove that using whoa uh, so you can prove two or three variable theorems using axioms but once you prove a theorem you can use that in the proof of a subsequent theorem for example 12b uh, so this is basically let me write it out two and three variable theorems twelve b prove that x or y and z is x or y and x or z okay so for the proof, we are basically going to use, turns out, 12a, which is the distributive rule. So for the proof, we start with the right-hand side because, again, before you start proving anything, just take a look at what we have to do. And if you think about it, the right-hand side in this case has more terms than the left-hand side. So it will be intuitively obvious to start on the right-hand side and then go to the left-hand side. Or, of course, you can also start on the left-hand side and go to the right-hand side. But you really cannot, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say, okay, here's the left-hand side, here's the right-hand side, hence they are equal, etc., etc. Right? So it's, that's not the way to prove things. So now what we're going to do is we're going to write this using 12a. And on the exam, if I want to ask you to prove something, I'll give you, okay, here are some of the theorems, for example, you can use, right? So you have to use the theorems I give you. If you use any other theorem, you should first prove it on the exam before using it to prove the expression in question. But anyway, in this case, we're going to use the distributive theorem and it's assumed that this has already been proved. Okay. But applying the distributive theorem you get x and x or z or y and oops, x or z okay and using the distributive theorem again you get x and x or x and z or y and x or y and z okay So, going on, x and x is x, right? So, what I'll let you do is I'll let you fill in what are all the different theorems. So, let me write it out. Students, fill in uh, theorems that we used. Okay, so, I'm asking you to fill this in. So, x and x is x or x and z or x and y or y and z and basically what i'm doing is I, as i'm simplifying this i'm looking at i have an i on the left hand side so what i want on the left hand side is x or y and z so there should be somehow i should get x or y and z from this and then that tells me that i should try to keep y and z and try to simplify this part and that's what motivated me to do this 
Now, how do I eliminate this? If I use distributive theorem again, you get x or x sorry x and one or z or y or y and z. So basically, it's like this distributive theorem, but applied from right hand side to left hand side, if you will. But one or anything is one, so there's x and one or y and z again. Students fill in the missing theorems that we used. This is x or y and z, which is equal to the left hand side. So we are done. This little square means QED or quad error demonstratum. I've demonstrated what I've started out with, or what I've demonstrated what I wanted to do. And that's about it for this example. And that's about it for this online lecture video. So next time we'll continue with Boolean algebra. And please, again, if you haven't read the book before lecture, the appropriate sections, please read it. And please start practicing problems. All right, see you next lecture.